I guess everyone is here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we had this question. <clears throat> to but include batch information. Yes. Yeah, that's a good solution. So we could <clears throat> add the technical effect in the in linear models and hope that they it's well accounted for. But the issue is uh, so if we do that, the uh, linear model will try to equalize the means, uh, but uh, I mean, we won't see that here, but if you just try to equalize the means of the two groups, uh, that can lead, to, so there are two reasons that won't suffice or that won't work. So one reason is that uh, it equalizes the means, but it doesn't equalize the variances. And that's uh, the variances also are also different, right? And the second issue is that we have like uh, three single male species here, four multi-male species, and so if we j the the, the <clears throat> how to say uh, we have two and yeah we have non-human and chimp uh, groups. So if we had just two chimps and two humans, it would have been less of a problem. But because we also have non-human and chimp, uh, uh, non-human and non-chimp uh, observations in the second set, which are not represented in the first set. So because there's not a real full balance between the two data sets uh, in their contents, then, uh, I mean, th they wouldn't have to have the same, the same number of observations, but the, the same type of observations because that's uh, lacking that also makes uh, a simple solution not feasible uh, so both the problem of the variances and the need to correct the variances and also the need to um, the, the fact that we have uh, we, we don't have the same composition in the two data sets so one uh, solution we thought of uh, was uh, that we could potentially apply was to take a subset of both uh, data sets, which include the same species, humans and chimps. So assuming any human is a human, any chimp is a chimp, and good representatives of their species. Uh, then you, what you could do, you could use those subsets as reference to, to scale the expression values of the other individuals. Uh, so here we have six humans, five chimps. We could take five humans, five chimps, uh, and calculate the mean and standard deviation of this uh, of that data set. And uh, here we have two humans, two chimps. We could take calculate the mean and standard deviation of that data set, and then uh, subtract from each data. So let's uh, perhaps write it here so we have data set one uh, and we have the subset of data set one subset d1 and if we subtract from the data set one values the mean of subset d1 and divide that by the variance of subset d1 or the standard deviation that is a kind of that would lead us to scale uh to scale the values here so that they have uh they are transformed to have the subset uh the subset have mean zero and the subset have standard deviation one so if this were the full data perhaps i can show it easier here in a second uh let's take this gene Okay, these are expression values. And my first subset would be the first five humans. These are all humans. And the first five chimps that come from microarrays. Okay, this is my subset. <coughs> Oops, sorry. And if I so this is my subset data. If I scale this subset data, oops, um, yeah, it, because it applies on a, to a function, it uh, produces weird uh, format, but perhaps this will work better. So this is a scaled version of the data. What is scaling? Scaling is 
basically subtracting the mean uh, subtracting the mean of an of, sorry uh, I should put it this way subset minus mean subset divided by the standard deviation of subset what will give me it will give me a set of values actually what scale is doing here is the same thing so you see the same values uh, where the mean of this transformed data is basically zero this is uh, just rounding error it's zero and the standard deviation is one okay mean zero standard deviation one so the subset is transformed uh, to a mean of zero standard deviation one and then one extra individual here this one i didn't include in the subset just randomly i chose this one um, shouldn't matter much but it would be good of course to make sure that it doesn't matter uh, so this individual we hadn't included it was also transformed alongside the others so its expression value was um, from its expression value i subtracted the mean and i also divided the resulting value the resulting difference by the standard deviation of the subset so in the end what i got was um, if i apply this um this i'm sorry here if i apply, apply this transformation on my original data uh, which was called uh, on the original data that also includes the that lone uh, human that i hadn't included that's 11 so i get these values and uh, this human, as you see, it does uh, well. Now this data set, for instance, it might have a slightly, uh, it also has a standard deviation one. Okay, that's, uh, I guess, luck. Mm. I'm, I cannot be so lucky. No, there must be something wrong here. I did. I took the first five humans. Uh, I'm sorry. Ah, because this is six to eleven. It should be seven to eleven, right? Uh, first five humans. I should skip six and then, of course, horrible. Sorry. <laughs> uh, my sorry. My subset should go from seven. I didn't check, and of course, each time I have to check because I do these bugs all the time. Now it's correct. And now, if I um, now if I apply my transformation, now the mean is not exactly uh, the, now the mean is not, not exactly zero because of this uh, because of that lone um, human. I hope you followed. Any questions here, or was it was I too fast? So. Again, the main idea was using a subset of the data here uh, to do scaling, this part and uh, this part, so that they have, uh, and transform the data, so apply a simple function uh, so that the this subset of the data has mean zero, and uh, mean zero, and uh, st1 okay and then what i do is i also do the same here i take a subset which is balanced i take the humans two humans and two chimps uh here i have five humans five chimps two humans two chimps i hope that uh, all chimps are equal and all humans are also equal and they are good representatives of their species and and then I apply the same transformation on this part of the data set, okay? So I calculate the mean of this subset to this other subset. Uh, I calculate the standard deviation. I apply, uh, I subtract the mean of the subset and standard deviation of the subset from all the other values, from gorilla, blah, blah. So what then happens is that uh, I have two sets of data with, which have means close to zero but not exactly zero, and standard deviation is close to one, but not exactly one. Uh, but where subsets of the humans and chimps within those two data sets have 
exactly mean zero and standard deviation one. I hope. Was that clear? Any further explanation needed? How I implement that? Uh, basically, I create this is the subset of the data, not just for uh, a single gene, but uh, for uh, across all genes. The first five humans and the first five chimps, as you see here. I, I then also do the same. I take the subset for the uh, from the other group, two humans, two chimps, for the, from the RNA stick data. And then what I do is here, I do my first transformation. I perhaps I should move this here. It's easier to follow. Yeah, once I've uh, got my first uh, subset, I from that part from the microarray data, from all the microarray data, I I subtract the row means of this data set. Row means is a uh, shortcut function. You might already know it applies. It calculates the means of uh, rows in a, of a matrix. So this is the mean of this first subset uh, for the first gene, for the second gene, etc. So I subtract the values in this vector from uh, the microarray data set. Oops. And I call that, uh, I give that a name, mat1n. So here, thus I have shifted the means of the microarray data towards uh, around zero. As you see, we have negative values, positive values, and the mean of this matrix would be something close to zero, we can imagine. Uh, and then, but that's not enough. I also want to make sure that the standard deviations will be close to one, the standard deviations based on the uh, subset. That's a bit more trickier to do what I did. You could find perhaps more elegant solutions for all the rows in my matrix. So this is my matrix, right, transformed matrix for each row. Uh, I becomes, uh, an, I is an index that goes from one to the number of rows. Uh, I take the value in those rows, in that row, uh, and then I divide it by the standard deviation uh, of the, I divide it by the standard deviation of the um, subset matrix, the human chimp equal, uh, equal number matrix. Okay, so I divide by standard deviation each gene of the uh, subset standard deviation. And uh, I also need to transpose because supply produces the output along the columns. And when I run this, let's check. Okay, we got, uh, by the way, because we use supply, we lost the column names. Uh, but yeah, we have a uh, um, matrix which should have also standard deviation close to one. That's correct, mean close to uh, zero. That's also correct, mean changed, of course, a bit of the transformation. Okay, so this was the first step. The second step is to apply the same on the uh, RNA sequencing part of the matrix. We got the two humans and chimps from the RNA sequencing. This is our subset. Again, based on a, we, we calculate the mean of each gene and we calculate the standard deviation of each gene and we first subtract the, uh, this mean, the mean of this row from all the, all the RNA sequencing data. So calculate the mean here would be some small value and we subtract from each value here for the first row that uh, small value and the same for the second row, etc. Goes on like that. And then in the second step, we also divide by the standard deviations from the subset. And here we go. Uh, and now we have, let's also double check that this worked. We can take the mean, oops, um, mean is, uh, yeah, because the, we have uh, we have NANs now. What, why do we have NANs? Can anybody tell me?
stupid NANs or NAs. <laughs> Why do we get NAs? There weren't, uh, I can tell you there weren't any NAs in the original data set. Mm, and if I say sum, what, one and two? Oy. Yeah, we didn't have NAs there. But this guy has NAs. At which step do you think we introduced NAs? Ah, maybe I got some results because they were also, thank you, Shevar, perfect, yes. Uh, if if some rows had all zeros, the standard deviation well, or or they, if they all had the same number, the standard deviation would be zero, and then dividing something by zero, we would get NAs. I mean, we could also have got infinity, but doesn't matter. Take in R one over zero, that's infinity. Mm, I'm not sure why. Well, that doesn't matter. You 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 see uh, th that should be the source of the problem. Of course, if we had time, it would be really uh, prudent to go back and identify where those NAs uh, exist and to double check that those correspond to rows where there are all uh, the, the values are all the same. I mean, just guessing that this could be the source of the problem and <laughs> continuing. Uh, is not good practice. It's always if you encounter some uh, error or error-like pattern, it it's always useful to go back check the real data. But because for sake of time, we can't do that now. Okay, so uh, b basically, the next step would be <coughs> um, to to basically jo join together these two data sets. We'll deal with the NAs, uh, NAs or NANs in a second. Uh, we'll just join these two data sets and continue uh, with that data as we uh, had before. But for, uh, for um, how to say, to be able to compare expression values across genes, uh, which we will be doing in a, we will be doing uh, shortly, um, it kind of is, useful to add back the uh, average expression levels to the genes. Now, currently, as you see here, the, um, I say row means, the means of each row would be close to zero, not exactly zero because of, um, you know, of the individuals which were not included in the subsets, but they will be close to zero. And so, it uh, kind of makes sense to add back the average expression levels. And what we could do would, could be uh, add back the average expression from the RNA sequencing part or the microarray part. Here I just, um, this is totally arbitrary. I, uh, calculated, I calculated the means of the microarray subset, means of the, um, means of the, uh, RNA sequencing subset, uh, and then means of the means, and then I added these values. So apparently this is, for instance, the first gene is not very highly expressed. The second is more moderately expressed. This is relatively highly expressed, uh, and so on. So I added the means of those means to the, uh, to the matrix. When I do that, uh, they receive, so each uh, row should receive uh, this value. So when I run this, I also would like to add the row names back. That's uh, simple. I had this original mat12 uh, or 1-2 object. And now if I check my matrix, the values look more reasonable. As you see, uh, the first gene again had low expression. The sixth gene had higher expression, blah, blah. Uh, if we do summary, um, as you see, we have some values which are have become NAs in the uh, in the RNA sick part, and we can get rid of those. There, there is this. Uh, I mean, there there is there are different ways you could do that. Uh, what I did was uh, there is this is NA function. So I summed up the rows for each. Um, 
for each column I summed up the rows. I could also have used the uh, row sums. Uh, and then I applied this function is na, which does what? Uh, it gives true or false depending on if it's any or not. And then I use the exclamation mark to reverse the falses into trues and vice versa. And then I use that to filter out those genes. Uh, anyway, so we get, we lose further some 150 or 100 genes, something like that. Uh, and we have our matrix. Let's double check its sound. Okay. Uh, we we did some scaling. Of course, we have no idea whether it worked or not. So let's uh, check again the two um, patterns we earlier checked. Uh, one was the box plot, the distribution of uh, expression values. Um, I, I do a, a box plot adding one and then logging. Why do I log here? Perhaps I shouldn't, I didn't want, would I need to log? Ah, wait a second. Yeah, in the original data, it's not. Ah, <laughs> no, Maria, uh, you were right. I think the original data isn't uh, wasn't logged. Um, yeah, and uh, that, that's why I was <laughs> logging here. But uh, anyway, it, it's okay. Um, so for our purposes, okay. So now we have uh, we have the data um, scaled. The only thing we didn't do any extra normalization, as you uh, realize, we just scaled uh, the two data sets, the microarray, microarray and the RNA sequencing data sets, so that uh, they're the the subsets of humans and chimps with equal numbers uh, have the same mean and standard deviation. Uh, and that's why, so these, uh, one of the, these should be the gorilla. So it, it doesn't work perfectly well, uh, but on average, the distributions are now much, much more compatible. And let's also run the uh, principal components uh, plot. And, okay, here. Oops, the most exciting moment. Did we manage? And yes, so what do we see? We have the principal component one now separating the species. And uh, separating species, in fact, not based on phylogeny, but based on the, uh, it, it turns out to be the mating behavior, right? The second one uh, separates the, the uh, monkeys, old world monkeys uh, from the apes. So this could be, um, a phylogenetic uh, thing, but here uh, at least um, it's not direct phylogeny. The human and gorilla are clumped together, uh, the macaque and chimp are clumped together, and there is no obvious, uh, there's no obvious uh, data source effect anymore, right? So it, it looks, uh, yeah, it looks as if it nicely worked. Um, yeah, so of course there might be still some genes which haven't, uh, where there might still be strong uh, data source influences. Uh, so one has to be careful, but overall, at least we, it seems as if we have managed to get rid of the um, data source effect, despite the data being from, coming from very different platforms, like one microarray and one uh, RNA sequencing. So yeah, as long as things are balanced, this works, but if, if, for instance, we didn't have any humans in the RNA sequencing data set, it wouldn't have worked, right? Um, or if we had ignored the species composition, I guess we would also not have got as nice a result. It wouldn't have been so successful, or we, we might have introduced biases artifacts in the data even. So well, if there is some subset of the data that you can use to as a reference point, uh, then the, this approach can work. And let's look at that uh, single gene again uh, that we had earlier studied. Um, yeah, here we are. Um, 
And as you see, the chimps are here, the humans are here, um, the gorilla is here, and uh, there seems to be, yes, the, the clustering mainly seems to be by species. So this is cool. Um, any, any questions here? Okay, our next, uh, we'll now address three more questions. Uh, one is, uh, are the convergent patterns that we uh, observed, are they really significant in the sense that uh, can we really, uh, is there a systematic um, trend of uh, the gorilla uh, being closer to human than to chimpanzee? So the PC is just a you know, description, it's a summary of the data. Uh, and it can be really powerful, but it doesn't uh, it doesn't quantify uh, our reliance, our confidence in the uh, in the pattern. There's no direct uh, quantification for that. Uh, for that, we could uh, perform. A, give me a second. Uh, we could perform a hypothesis testing. You might think of different approaches. Uh, can you think of any approaches? Anything to share? So a relatively powerful thing, um, uh, a way to test this idea, whether there is convergent expression patterns, it would be, I'm still sharing my screen, right? Uh, so it would be to uh, model the data so that uh, given the phylogeny, we could try to see if the human and gorilla have a different, uh, mean expression pattern, mean expression than the chimp and macaque, but given the phylogeny. And a um, uh, friend of ours and also other people, they have uh, used uh, what's, what are called orstein ullenbeck models of gene expression evolution, uh, of um, actually, it doesn't have to be gene expression evolution uh, for, uh, these are models that you can use to study the evolution of uh, any kind of phenotype. Uh, where there is, um, on the one hand, it has a Brownian motion-like component, so there is a drift component, random noise, the phenotype evolving from a certain common ancestor over time. The more time it, there passes, the more deviation there can happen. Uh, but then there's also another factor, which is a, uh, a factor that draws the expression levels towards a certain optimum, negative selection, uh, a negative selection component. So it has drift and negative selection together. And given this uh, type of model, you can further test the, uh, uh, the hypothesis that humans and gorillas have a different mean optimal expression than chimp and macaque. So you would be comparing two models. In one model, all species have the same optimum and the other model, uh, human and gorilla have a different optimum than chimp and macaque. The second model is, of course, more complicated. It has more parameters, and then you could uh, do uh, uh, a KK information criterion, whatever, some comparison across models given certain number of parameters, how much uh, variance uh, one explains better than the other one. I think in my, my friend was doing a simple maximum likelihood, and somehow the so she, she was calculating a likelihood ratio and uh, they were supposed, the likelihood ratios under the null hypothesis of no difference, they should be uh, distributed, uh, they should have a chi-square distribution. And uh, so she was using in then the chi-square to uh, the likelihood ratio and the chi-square to uh, decide if there is evidence, there was evidence for con convergent evolution. So this is a, relatively nice, it's a nice uh, way to test uh, not just simple differential ex expression, but uh, to uh, test this given a certain phylogeny, uh, quite nice and sophisticated. Uh, I should, well, the, in the in this bioarchive thing, we are using the method. The method itself was uh, published in MBE five years ago or something. Uh, but what, because uh, we are much more simple fellows, at least I'm a much more <laughs> simple uh, person, um, 
before applying this, I had uh, tried some other approach and simply it, testing whether the gorilla uh, shows higher in its expression profile. We have unfortunately a single gorilla, we have two macaques. Uh, I asked whether the gorilla is showing significantly higher correlation with the human than to the chimp. If there was no, um, if there was no convergent evolution uh, tendency, then the gorilla should be on average equally distant to the human and chimp, as we said in this DNA sequence, that's how the, it is. In other tissues, you would also expect the same. Uh, this is actually something we should, I'm not sure if we <laughs> check whether in other tissues. But, and then the macaque um, should be closer to the chimp than to the human. Again, if under neutral evolution, uh, the macaque uh, neutral evolution plus negative selection, if there's no uh, convergent evolution related to mating type, the macaque should be equally distant. But if it shows higher uh, similarity to chimpanzee, this would um, th this would suggest um, that uh, yeah, this would be compatible with um, with the convergent evolution. And so th that's not difficult to do in our case. We already have the data, uh, and what we can what I did here was uh, define three vectors based on the column names, the set of humans, set of chimps, and macaques. Uh, okay. And then basically what you can do is across all the, um, all the expressed genes we have in this uh, combined data set, we can check, we can calculate the correlation between this is gorilla, the correlation between uh, the gorilla individual and all the humans. So this is an apply function. It runs along the columns of our matrix. You see the two. Uh, it runs along the columns and each, so basically each X will be a human expression vector, one human individual's expression vector. Uh, we can actually show that explicitly. So X, oops, sorry, like this. X will be the human, uh, one human, the first human's expression first. And then if we calculate the correlation between that and the gorilla, this is the gorilla expression. This is the first human's expression. The, it's very highly correlated. Uh, and then we can also, uh, we, we can do that for all the humans. This is for all the humans. So calculating correlation between each human's expression profile, expression vector, and the gorilla expression vector, okay? So these are human gorilla expression uh, the, the co correlation coefficients. And then very simple approach. We can do the same with the chimp. These are the chimp values. They're all very high, as you see, not very surprising. But then do they differ in any way? between, uh, is there a difference? And indeed, this is the human, so basically human gorilla correlations and chimp gorilla correlations, perhaps I should change this to HG and CG, human gorilla and chimp gorilla. And human gorilla values tend to be much higher than uh, chimp gorilla values. It, all, of, all of them are high, but uh, there it does seem to be a significant, uh, a, a strong trend, and we can test this. We can use the t-test, but uh, t-test, uh, of course, assumes equal variance and blah blah blah, uh, and no outliers. So without, it might be better to go without any assumptions. We could use the man with new test, which is implemented in this R Wilcox test function, uh, two-sided. Why not? And we get. Um, relatively, well, uh, low p-value. So suggesting that human, the, the gorilla is closer to human in its testis expression profile than uh, to chimp. Okay, that was one gorilla, but how about the macaques? Uh, so we could, of course, uh, also test each macaque separately. That would be probably uh, nicer, but then uh, what kind of issue could there be if we were testing each macaque separately? Then we would have um, for each macaque, 
for each human, we would have two comparisons with two macaques. And for each chimp, we would have comparisons with two macaques. We have two times more data here. Uh, that sounds nice, but uh, it might also, we wouldn't be able to apply the same simple man with new test or we'll click some, some rank some test on this data, right? Why? Because uh, the rep, I mean, we can, if we have replicates in our data, we cannot ignore those replicates. We have somehow to incorporate it, those in the model or we have to calculate the means of the replicates, but we cannot uh, treat replicates as independent observations. Okay, this is super critical. I hope everybody's clear with that. If not, please ask and uh, I can try to explain again why we couldn't simply calculate all correlation between all humans and all macaques and all chimps and all macaques and run the same analysis. Should I explain again? Yes. So uh, here we had uh, we have six human no not six uh, eight humans two, uh, six plus two eight humans and seven chimpanzees. We had one gorilla, and we calculated um, eight values here, uh, seven values here, and we tested the difference using a man with new test. So now. Coming to macaques, we want to do the same with macaques. I'm sorry. Pardon. Is Sean Tersim? He on the Kusona? Are you doing something? Come on, So, if we want to do the same with macaques, we have two macaques. We could basically calculate the. We could do this. Okay. Uh, apply this with. Uh, both macaques instead of calculating the mean at macaque one and macaque two. So then we would have uh, uh, how many? Uh, 18, no, uh, 16 values here and 14 values here, right? Seven chimps times two macaques, seven times two and the eight times two here. Uh, and then we the question is, could we apply the same test, the Wilkinson rank sum test or man with new test on this on, on such data? 16 correlation coefficients, 14 correlation coefficients, are they significantly different? Could we apply the same uh, approach? And the answer is no. Uh, the answer is no because, oh my God, uh, we have. <laughs> fire alarm, but I guess it should be okay. <laughs> As always, it must be false alarm. Usually it is. Um, anyway, you can hear me, right? Um, so the, the, the reason is that if we have replicates in the data, uh, which don't represent independent observations, so the correlation between human one and uh, macaque human one and macaque one and the correlation between human one and macaque two these are related these are not independent observations because they both involve human one right human one's um information is replicated and it's it, it's not independent it's not uh, like uh, human two and macaque two this would be something else uh but if the same individual's information is coming in, then uh, there is uh, replication. And here, treating the data as independent, it would it would inflate our false positive rate. Okay, it would uh, create uh, false positives. And and so, what we can one simple solution would be to take the mean of the macaque uh, of the two macaques. That's what I do here. And uh, then, then do the. We can plot the box plot. As you see now, the relationship has uh, reversed. Uh, and also, we can run the Wilkinson rank sum test. And uh, again, we see a significant difference. Okay. Perhaps I should add here. 
uh, can't use both macaques uh, to due to pseudo replication. I'm in front of the window, so if there's a bad fire, I can uh, jump outside. <laughs> um, okay. So, okay, now two more things before the, or one more thing before the break. Um, we did seem to find that there is a um, trend of convergent uh, transcriptome evolution using these species. Of course, it's very unfortunate that there was only one gorilla involved and still there's no other uh, test data from gorillas published. Of course, it's very difficult to uh, get. Um, but with this data, the, 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 we, we see this pattern of um, uh, gorilla being closer to human and macaque being closer to chimp. And in fact, if you also use mouse and rat data, which are also multi-male, they also show higher similarity to, uh, to chimp than human. So the, 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 uh, these guys also follow the same pattern. And now we want to add a single male uh, rodent here with the Mirich, uh, you, with whom you might have met uh, through this course, uh, and with the Spalax, uh, the mole rat, which is yeah, supposed to be single male, in a way, it has uh, relatively small testicles, apparently. And we want to see if uh, transcriptome-wise, it is also more similar to human than chimp. OK. Um, we could also ask the question, OK, are these genes which show differences among species that we uh, were studying, like the, uh, the gene we had taken as example, do such genes uh, are, are such genes uh, enriched in any specific functions? And uh, I'll just show you a brief uh, uh, description of how people usually deal with such uh, approach. So one thing is uh, we'll need to define a set of uh, differentially expressed genes. You could do this in many different ways. You could use that uh, likelihood ratio test, for instance, the phylogenetic take base likelihood ratio test and choose genes which show significant effect, uh, significant convergent evolution signal. That's what we actually had done in the uh, in our original uh, analysis, but uh, uh, that's too much for here. So what we can simply do is uh, we can compare, let's say, humans and chimps uh, and uh, test for differential expression between the two species and those genes which show the, um, some kind of uh, re reasonable signal for differential expression, we can uh, study their expression patterns and we can further test for enrichment, functional enrichment among those genes. Um, so let's take the first gene as an example. Um, we can plot the, uh, yeah, so th this is the pass if we add in the, the first gene, well, it shows some signal, not super strong. If we do a work extent test, for instance, uh, it's not super uh, strong, but if we took the third gene, um, yeah, here most likely the signal would be much stronger indeed. Um, the, again, the non-parametric test uh, is telling us there's something going on. Uh, we, we could apply this test to um, all uh, genes in our data set, in our joint normalized uh, data set. Normalized meaning uh, the, the scaling uh, we applied. And if we do that and we collect the p-values here, this dollar sign p-value uh, collects the uh, p-value output of the function. Uh, and if you do that, here are our p-values. Let's check the distribution of the p-values. If there's no effect, how will p-values be distributed? Uh, if the null hypothesis were true and humans and chimps had no difference, how would p-values we applied on uh, 7,000 genes be distributed? 7,000 genes, they would be distributed uniformly. Yes, thank you, Maria. 
they would be distributed uniformly. So let's check how they are distributed. In our case, we see a very strong skew towards lower values. So this is uh, encouraging. It uh, suggests uh, many genes have much lower p-values than we would expect uh, if there was no effect. And then, um, we, uh, of course, these are raw p-values. Uh, we can account for, the, for multiple testing um, using one of the uh, standard corrections, uh, this p.adjust function. Uh, corrects for uh, multiple testing. Uh, we could use the benjamin yekutili method, which also apparently is theoretically uh, robust to, to dependence among the different tests. Uh, so perhaps more robust than uh, benjamin yekutili uh, for um, relatedness in, the, in transcriptome data, because our genes aren't really fully independent. They, you know, are expressed in pathways and so on. So if we apply the benjamin yekutili correction and uh, we, we stored those results in a second um, object, and this is the distribution, um, some genes, yeah, they, is, they are assigned uh, p-value one, uh, but then there's quite a few which have relatively low uh, values. And then we could, yeah, just uh, randomly uh, choose a, a cutoff like 0.05, uh, and uh, and to choose those genes. Uh, now, in fact, the next step is to uh, do a clustering of gene expression patterns. So to distinguish between genes more highly expressed in human and lowly expressed in, uh, in chimps and vice versa. Um, and for that, we can use k-means clustering. There are also other uh, approaches you could potentially use, uh, but uh, to use k-means clustering, you would wish to ensure that each gene has the same mean and standard deviation so that uh, each gene contributes to clustering the same. If you don't do scaling, this uh, scaling here, uh, then genes which have overall high expression will be clustered together. Genes which have overall low expression will be clustered together because it calculates Euclidean distances. So the k-means uh, algorithm, uh, which some of you at least might be um, familiar with. It's a heuristic uh, unsupervised uh, clustering algorithm uh, where you define the number of um, groups you want to cluster your uh, data. Uh, and it calculates, so if, if our, imagine our gene expression data set, so this data set here, uh, what it does is it calculates um, uh, among rows, it calculates uh, distances, I think Euclidean distances by default, and then uh, it groups, it, it randomly first groups uh, all the genes into two, and then uh, changes, switches the membership of the two groups so that the distances among group members become smallest. Uh, and it starts from a random uh, point and then it switches. Uh, the, it's a simple algorithm that you can check uh, on Wikipedia to minimize distances. And uh, because Euclidean distances will be influenced by not only the expression patterns of the genes, but also the mean expression values here, so the average here, if we are not interested in clustering genes based on their, uh, their expression magnitude, uh, but if we are more interested in the expression pattern across individuals, so if we want to use basically the, uh, if we want to find clusters of genes which are highly correlated in their expression values across these individuals, then uh, we would need to do scaling. Okay, so when we do scaling, I store that uh, resulting object in some other under uh, some other name. Basically, the, the mean of um, each um, row it has become zero and the standard deviation has become one. And so k-means can, uh, the, the only information uh, available for k-means is the correlation, uh, is the uh, variation among, uh, among samples. So I did the scaling. I also subset my matrix to only include uh, the, so-called differentially expressed genes. Uh, I could have 
first subset and then done scaling wouldn't have mattered at all because uh, they're in independent uh, processes. In the end, I end up with uh, 1900 genes and uh, this is also scale data. I can use, uh, I, I can uh, perform uh, k-means on this. Uh, why do I take a subset of differential express genes? Simply because it, it helps concentrate the, the day. So many genes might simply not be differentially expressed although overall there is a strong species or mating type effect, uh, many, many genes might simply not differ at all. So removing those, I can uh, find patterns more efficiently. But in real life, you could try both ways. Um, and this is k-means. I'm speeding up. This is k-means. Uh, or why not? Uh, let's stick to the schedule. And let's stop here and start at one past. Okay. Sure. Yeah. So ten minutes free. Uh huh. Yeah. One okay. past. Five. Here. Okay. 